Uh, yes, my name is Aleta Witt. I'm from South Africa, from the Hadebeer Zouk Radio Astronomy Observatory. And uh, today I'll be talking about the status and direction of the K-band celestial reference frame. And the slide here whoopsie, uh, shows the sky distribution of um, sources in our K-band celestial uh, reference frame. Hmm. It's not changing. Okay, I'm so sorry about that. Some technical difficulties, but let's go. Okay, yes, so the K-band celestial reference frame, there you get an example of what it looks like today, the distribution of sources on the sky. So what I'll talk about today is first just uh, a bit about celestial reference frames, uh, the international standard, why we observe at K-band, some applications of the celestial reference frame, and then, of course, talk about K-band itself, the history and status of the K-band celestial reference frame, a little bit about imaging and source structure, and then looking to the future, um, celestial reference frames at even higher frequencies that, uh, than K-band, the roadmap for high frequency celestial reference frame work, and most importantly today, I think, why K-band, why the celestial reference frame needs a uh, career. Okay, so celestial reference frames, um, so this uh, slide shows a picture um, uh, of the stone monolith temple on the island of Malta in the middle of the Mediterranean. And um, what I'm talking about here is astrometry. To build reference frames, we need astrometry, which involves the precise measurements of the positions and movements of celestial objects. But we were not the first to do this. As I said, this is the stone monolith temple on the island of Malta. And on the first day of spring or autumn or summer or winter, the sun would shine through this main doorway and it would illuminate different parts of this temple um, on the inside. So people were thinking about the positions of celestial objects for 5,000 years at least. A little bit about the history of, um, of astrometry. Uh, so I already uh, talked about we weren't the first people um, to do this. There's evidence that some 5,000 years ago people were doing, uh, were doing things. But in terms of the, um, uh, uh, um, uh, well, uh, if we talk about the, uh, um, the stars, um, and uh, the fact that um, people thought that they had this set constellation that just moved overhead. Um, in 130 uh, BC, Hipparchus noticed precession um, at around 50 arc seconds per year. 130 BC, no telescopes, really impressive guy. Then came uh, the telescopic era of Galileo, that made a lot of progress, but in terms of astrometry and moving away from this notion of the um, uh, set stars in 1718, Halley from the Halley Comet thing um, noticed there were proper motions um, around an arc second per year. The fact that individual stars have this velocity relative to the whole system. Bradley in 1729, aberration, um, Earth uh, um, orbits around the Sun and it has this velocity in 1860, uh, the 1860 year mutation in 1730, and then parallax, how far away are the stars? That was in 1838, around an arc second. But it was only relatively recently that radio uh, uh, astronomy was invented in the 1930s, and VLBI was only invented in the 1960s. And today we'll mostly talk about VLBI, very long baseline interferometry, the technique we use to do astrometry and to build these reference frames um, of ours. So at first people um, were getting down to, to less than an arc second, then they noticed they could push things even further down uh, to around a milli arc second. Now we're getting down to fractions of milli arc seconds, and we hope to get down to these tens of micro arc seconds in our generation. In terms of optical and astrometry, ground-based optical ran into some problem to get greater uh, precision in astrometry. So there was this uh, space mission dedicated to astrometry, the Parkhurst mission, 
Um, that was around a milli arc segment. And then um, Gaia came along. And Gaia is huge because for the first time, we have uh, competitors with precision comparable to VLBI. And that, that is really wonderful for doing comparisons. Okay, so you do astrometry, but that uh, kind of necessitates the need to compile catalogs that include the positions, proper motions, and parallaxes of these objects. I already talked about a carcass, 130 BC. Uh, he had this catalog of positions of 1,080 stars, and um, it is the oldest comprehensive known catalog uh, with positions of stars. Um, long ago, in terms of the fundamental catalogs for the IAU, um, everything was based on optical observations, these meridian observations, and the last of those catalogs were the FK5 catalog. Uh, but these were all based on measuring the positions of galactic stars. In the 1980s, um, VLBI started measuring the positions of these extragalactic objects, the quasars. And then the IAU um, saw that, well, optical is limited by the proper motions of the stars. Each of these stars has some velocity, everything in the system is moving around. So there was this move from the galactic stars using optical going to extragalactic objects, the quasars. They're very distant, we measure no uh, proper motion, and things moved over to VLBI um, measuring the positions of quasars. So the first frame, the International Celestial Reference Frame 1, was adopted by the IAU as the fundamental standard. That was in 1997. Um, that was followed by the ICRF-2 in 2009, and then today the ICRF-3 is the current international standard um, frame. I talked about Hipparchos, the optical space mission. Again, they measured the galactic stars, but there's also a Parker's um, celestial reference frame. That was adopted as the primary celestial reference frame, but in the optical, and of course that was followed by Gaia, and now we have um, Gaia, the Gaia Celestial Reference Frame 3, which is now the standard frame um, in the optical. Okay, so in terms of VLBI, the cu current standard international celestial reference frame is the ICRA 3. I already said it was adopted by the IAU in August 2018, and it has high precision radio VLBI astrometric measurements of the positions of more than 5,000 um, AGN. The wonderful thing about the icr 3 is that it's the first multi-frequency frame. So we have catalogs at the standard SX bands, but then also we have a catalog at K-band, 24 gigahertz, and also at KA band at 32 gigahertz. And recently we also started investigating the potential for a celestial reference frame at Q-band at 43 gigahertz. Okay, so this is uh, um, what the icr 3 looks like, the sky distribution of sources at the different uh, frequency bands. This is the standard SX band um, frame. The colors here indicate the precision of each um, object in the frame. This is the K-band frame for icr 3 and this is the KA band frame. Um, the SX band frame has the longest history. Observations started in 1979, so it also has the most sources. And in terms of icr 3 the precision for the SX band is about 1.5 times better than um, K and KA band. But we'll talk mostly about the K band frame um, today. Okay, so what is the motivation for going to higher frequencies if we do celestial reference framework? Um, uh, the standard frequencies are hurt by RFI issues, we struggle with RFI issues. Going to higher radio frequencies allow observations closer to the sun, observations closer to the galactic plane. It provides calibrated sources for VLBI at the higher frequencies. And we found that typically stations have K-band receivers. It's only the DSN dishes that have the KA band receivers. And we're seeing fewer and fewer antennas, particularly in the south, with SX receivers. And then, of course, the factor of free improvement in interferometer resolution relative to the standard frequency bands. But the most important thing for us and why we decided to go to higher frequencies is that we see that sources are more compact, more point-like if you go to higher radio, um, radio frequencies. And of course, if you want to measure, uh, precisely measure the positions of sources, it's important that um, you have sources that are really compact um, or point-like. 
a little bit about Gaia before we move on to K-band. Um, so the uh, Gaia is this optical astrometric space mission that was launched in 2013. The latest data release is um, data release free. It has data from August 2014 to May 2017. And Gaia did astrometry for about 1.8 billion sources. In terms of the astrometric catalog, it's the Gaia CRA free, uh, more than 1.6 million quasars uh, in the Gaia celestial reference frame. And just more than 4,700 of those are also radio loud sources. In terms of the precision of Gaia for the uh, brighter Gaia sources, around 100 micro arc seconds, which is comparable to what we get in VLBI on average. But uh, for the best observed VLBI sources, uh, we nominally get better uh, precision around 30, 40 micro arc seconds. Okay, so that is Gaia. Now um, let's look at all the wonderful applications. Okay, so the VLBI technique synchronizes radio antennas across continents into the super telescope the size of the world. Using that, we get better than part per billion accuracy around 100 micro arc seconds. So given that, here are all the amazing things that we can do with a celestial reference frame. Um, first, calibrators for astronomy. So these sources are used as face calibrators for astronomy and for differential astronomy. Um, alignment of the planetary ephemeris is another one. Uh, we do this differential VLBI uh, measurements of planet orbiting spacecraft res with respect to the ICRF sources. And this obtains the position of our planets within the ICRF. Um, spacecraft navigation is another one. Again, um, we do this differential VLBI measurements between an ICRF source and then the spacecraft radio radio signal. Maybe you know about the DART mission. It was this NASA space mission aimed at testing a method of planetary defense against near Earth objects. And by the way, it was um, a successful mission. So actually we can say that ICRF also contributes to um, saving our planet. Um, then the satellite tracking, um, getting precise orbit determination for, for satellites using um, for our GPS satellites using ICRF sources. And also by observing the changes in the apparent positions of extragalactic sources, we can test the theories of special relativity, general relativity. Um, and then, of course, the ICRF provides the sources that we use in geodetic VLBI. And, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, with geodetic VLBI, we then measure the <clears throat> orientation of Earth and space, station motions. This, in turn, contributes to the realization of the international terrestrial reference frame. It allows studies of the motion of the tectonic plates, the interior of Earth, atmospheric studies, ionosphere, troposphere. And lastly, the ICRF contributes to the realization of the global geodetic reference frame uh, for sustainable development. And this is a resolution that was adopted by the United Nations in 2015. And the idea is to have this high quality global coordinate system. And this is used for many applications. Things such as land ownership, engineering construction, precision agriculture, intelligent transport, navigation, climate change, sea level monitoring, and many, many more um, applications. Okay, but let's talk about the K-band celestial reference frame now. So in terms of the history, the first K-band frame was published by Lani and um, Charlot. Again, this is the sky distribution of sources um, in that reference frame. The, uh, uh, the colors here indicate the precision in right ascension for each of the objects. So they uh, used these 10 VLBA K-band sessions between 2002 and 2008, and they had 268 sources um, in the frame. As you can see, nothing in the far south, and the median precision in right ascension and declination around 100 micro arc seconds. This is what the frame looks like today, and I'll just go back and forth again, because this is very exciting to me, the huge amount of progress that we've made since the, um, since the Lanyi uh, and Charlot frame. So um, today we have 1,038 sources, uh, just over 2 million observations. Again, as I said, um, the uh, 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 colors here indicate the precision and right ascension. And this is from this K-band collaboration that we started in 2013, and we restarted observations in 2014. Um, we now have uniform spatial density. You can see we filled in the far south. 
and um, our median precision in right ascension and declination is now 47 and 80 micro arc seconds. So huge improvement. If you want to, wait, wait, where is it? If you want to see it again, oh, I think it's fantastic. Um, okay, so let's compare K-band to the current standard SX band. Um, so the top plot here shows the, uh, uh, the colors show the precision and right ascension, the bottom plot uh, precision and declination. So this is now for the standard SX band frame um, after ICRF. So there's about a thousand more sources than we had in ICRF free, uh, about 17.6 million observations, and there's a slight uh, uh, improvement in the precision uh, since ICRF free. Uh, the strengths of the SX band frame, of course, it still has the most sources by a factor of five. It has the best sensitivity, most observations, longer history, and also the density of sources here near the ecliptic, which is very important for interplanetary uh, navigation. Um, weaknesses of the <coughs> SX band frame, it's poorer near the galactic plane than K band due to um, interstellar media scattering, and itself, uh, in, in the self, it's weak due to a limited number of radio telescopes. So we have more radio telescopes in the north than in the south, but this is true for, for all the frames at all the frequency bands. And as I mentioned before, um, we think source structure looks better as you go to higher radio uh, frequency. So this is the current SX band frame. If we look at the current K band status, um, again, top plot showing the precision and right ascension and the bottom one in declination. We now have 1,038 sources uh, versus the 800-something sources we had for ICRF free, uh, just over 2 million observations, and huge improvement in the uh, precision in right ascension and declination. Um, the strengths of the K-band uh, is that we have uniform spatial density. It's the best band for near the galactic plane. The sources have less structure. They become more compact at the higher radio frequencies. And the wonderful thing is that we now have precision comparable to the SX frame. So since ICRE free 2018, where it was about 1.5 times worse, we now have comparable resolution, at least in, um, in right ascension. Some of the weaknesses, so we don't have dual band like SX or um, XKA. It's single band, so I, our ionosphere is imperfectly calibrated by, by GPS. The self is also weak. We have uh, this wonderful instrument, the VLBA in the north, with which we do observations. But for the deep south, we only have a single baseline, two antenna. The a telescope in Hattabeus Hook in South Africa and one in um, Tasmania uh, in Australia. So again, the self is weak. And then our precision, as you can see, is much worse in declination than right ascension. And this is because of a lack of north-south uh, baselines. Um, longer than about 3,000 uh, kilometers. So this is the uh, <coughs> current network status of K-band. Um, here we show the VLBA uh, that we use for uh, most of the observations, about 99% of the data is from, from the VLBA. But you can see there's nice long east-west baselines, but nothing longer than about 3,000 kilometers in a north-south direction. And we need that to improve our declinations. Um, for a long time, we only had the single baseline here between Hattie's Hook and Hobart. And then recently in October 2022, we started observations with uh, the Yebes 40 meter antenna in Spain. And um, <clears throat> just a month ago in March, we also started observations with um, the Korean VLBI network. And now we have this nice long north-south uh, uh, north baseline. Um, uh, with Korea as well, and this really nice long baseline between Hattabeus Hook and uh, Korea. So I'm sure you, you're familiar with the Korean VLBI network. We also use the Seong the Geodetic Station, and we think that Korea can make a significant contribution to um, the K-band work. Okay, so <clears throat> comparing the reference frames to Gaia, so now the top plot here shows all the sources in common with Gaia, uh, 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 the SX band sources in VLBI in common with Gaia. It's just over 2,400 sources. And the bottom plot shows the sources in common with the K band frame. There's 676 sources in common uh, with Gaia. And the thing really to note here is that um, K band has fewer outliers, 13.5% versus SX. 
But if we also look at the uh, precision in the right ascension and declination uh, for the SX sources in common with Gaia and the K-band sources, we see the precision is much, much better um, in K-band than SX band. And if we look at the differences, now this is the position differences between Gaia and SX um, over there and between Gaia and K-band. So these WRMS differences also slightly lower um, if we do comparisons with K-band um, and uh, versus um, SX band. So we are really impressed with the results of the K-band frame um, up to this point. Okay, so a bit about imaging and source structure. <clears throat> So the primary observable for geodetic and astrometric VLBI is this delay here, tau. And by measuring and modeling tau for each baseline of our network, we can then precisely infer the positions of the observed radio sources. And tau, yes, is dominated by this geometric component, but there are also other contributions from the atmosphere, instrumental effects, relativistic effects, and of course also source structure, which is not currently modeled. So source structure introduced significant errors in our astrometric delay measurements and also instabilities in our uh, source positions. So um, that's one of the reasons why we are moving to higher frequencies um, to K-band. If we look at the schematic, we have the central black hole there, maybe some thermal emission from optical, helical magnetic field lines, electrons get accelerated, and that's the part we're interested in, the radio core or the base of the radio jet and then sometimes we get this extended emission which we don't want we want the compact core and um, we see that as you go to higher radio frequencies this extended stuff tends to uh, go away so the source morphology generally is more compact going to the higher radio frequencies but also what we see is that the observed position of this peak brightness um, uh, point at uh, uh, um, higher frequencies is closer to the black hole, but also closer to the optical. So higher frequency frames permit the construction of a more accurate and stable celestial reference frame, we believe, but it's also very important in tying VLBI to the Gaia um, optical frame. So this is some examples of the imaging work that we've been doing. This is from our astrometric observations for the celestial reference frame. These are all VLBA. Um, images of ICRF sources and um, at K-band. So we just published the first uh, paper. This is on our first 28 epochs of images. Um, we are almost uh, completed um, uh, uh, the rest of the imaging. Then we'll have a total of 81 um, epochs, and this is for about 730 sources. Uh, so the first three examples here are sources that are relatively compact. There's some weak extended emission, but that's still fine for celestial reference framework. And most of our sources look like this compact structure with maybe some weak extended emission. Um, what we don't want for celestial reference framework um, is sources like this with bright extended emission or a strong second component. Sometimes we also see this... Uh, free bright components and then the absolute worst for celestial reference framework is um, something like this where you have the strong equal double this is the sources we we want to avoid and of course this is a source near the galactic plane so we're not detecting it on the uh, longer baselines okay so yes we do calibration and imaging using apes and diff map we also do model fitting we fit the core and the second brightest component and then also model fitting to the clean components themselves. This gives us an uh, idea of the overall extent or the jet direction. And then we also do some structure analysis uh, to find out more about the structure of the sources that we use in our celestial reference frame. This is just one example. Um, we have two sources here. This is a relatively compact source, some weak uh, structure. This is a source with some bright extended emission. Um, this is the results of our model fitting. Um, we can see the jet directions given in the legend over there for these two sources. And then um, we have these structure metrics that we use to measure the amount of uh, source structure. Um, <clears throat> so for both sources here, we get the peak brightness and the clean flux density. The ratio of those give us the compactness. So in this case, this is a compact source. Compactness is 0.8, it's close to one. Um, in the case of this source, it's much lower, 0.45. We also look at the radial extent, the extent of the source structure. In this case, it's the flux-weighted radial extent. 
Um, it's in milli arc seconds. We can see that um, it's much better for the top source, which is more compact, versus the one at the bottom at 1.3 milli arc seconds. And then um, the most useful metric is this structure index. So this is where we get the um, we measure the extra uh, 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 delay because of source structure for a range of possible uh, projected baselines, and then the uh, median value from all of these structural delay values, the log of that gives us this structure index value. It tells us the amount of source structure. So a value of one would be a very compact source. A, uh, a structure index of two uh, would be still a really good source for celestial reference framework. A value of three would be a not so good source and a value of four is a really bad source uh, to use for celestial reference framework. And one can see the top source here has a structure index of 1.2. And then the one um, at the bottom, a structure index of 3.3. So not an ideal source for our celestial reference framework. We also um, monitor source variability. So how do these sources change over time? Uh, that is very important. They can change significantly. And it's important for us to monitor how they change um, for our reference framework. So this is just some examples. This, um, uh, is an example of a source that we um, observed over all 28 epochs. Um, and um, the flux variability actually here is 40%, but this is an extreme example, the source. Then um, also the compactness that I just talked about, the radial extent, and the structure index um, monitored over um, all 28 uh, epochs. Okay, now looking to the future, um, celestial reference frames at even higher radio frequencies. So recently, we did these observations, near simultaneous observations on the VLBA, where we did observations at SX band, K band, and Q band. It was these 24-hour observations, one session directly after the other, using exactly the same set of sources, the same schedule. And we did these astrometric and imaging observations on the VLBA for 453 ICRF sources. And this was to see how the source structure changed from one band to the next, but also whether Q band is a viable option for celestial reference framework. So the images here is for the source NRAO 140, and this is at S band, X band, K band, and Q band, and also the results from our model fitting for each of these. And the thing that you should notice here is how the source structure improved going from S to, to Q band. Um, and we see this for, uh, for many of the sources. Um, the uh, 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 images here is all um, scaled to the minor axis of the beam so that we can compare the source structure. Um, in K-band here, this extended emission is not that big of a problem for celestial reference framework, but this really bright component here at X-band is definitely not good for celestial reference framework. So the source structure do get better as we go to the higher radio frequencies. This is the same source, um, but here we see the images on an absolute scale. And we can see also now the increase in resolution going from S to X to K to Q band, almost a factor of 20 in, uh, uh, um, improvement in resolution going from S to Q band. And also, again, um, how the source becomes more compact going to the higher radio frequencies. I talked about the structure index before that we used to um, uh, uh, assess the amount of structure. So in this case, um, what I've plotted here is the distribution of the st uh, structure index over all 453 sources. And this also shows us, if we look at the median values here, at S-band, the structure index is 3.52. Remember I said structure index of 3 or 4 is not good for celestial reference framework. At X-band, it's 2.39. K-band is down to 1.96. And at Q-band, 1.42. So definitely the improvement in interferometer resolution and also the more compact source morphology at higher radio frequencies um, is what we are after. Okay, then um, a roadmap for high frequency celestial reference framework. So there are many efforts to continue the maintenance and improvement of the international celestial reference frame. Um, we have a new working group um, that's looking towards ICRA4 and it's likely that this will be a truly multi-wavelength celestial reference frame that will also incorporate um, Gaia um, in, in this frame. In terms of our own work, um, we would like to improve some of our analysis at K-band, troposphere, ionosphere, 
um, uh, uh, modeling, uh, definitely correcting for the effect of source structure. Yes, the sources are more compact at higher frequencies, but we still have sources with significant structure. So correcting for the effects of source structure is one of the things we want to do. Ionospheric um, calibration. So I said before, we use GPS for our ionospheric calibration, but um, whoops, uh, only five of the VLBA stations currently have GPS. We've um, sent a request. We asked for them to install GPS at all the VLBA stations. And uh, we are confident that by the end of this calendar year, we will have uh, a GNSS stations at all 10 VLBA sites. Then JPL also designed this broadband A to 36 gigahertz receiver for the VLBA. Um, if that gets installed on all the VLBA antennas, then of course all our ionospheric calibration issues uh, will be solved. The other thing is sensitivity, always looking for better sensitivity. Uh, the VLBA is planning to upgrade to da data rates of eight gigabits per second. Um, we're also planning in the south currently, we work at two gigabits per second to upgrade to four gigabits per second. And then we also um, started a project uh, with the LMT in Mexico to add a K-band receiver on the LMT which would basically double the sensitivity on our VLBA baselines. So we visited Mexico and looked for a spot for a K-band receiver. So um, there's also a paper um, on that. And then again, that's this JPL broadband receiver that I just talked about would give us a factor of free increase um, in sensitivity. In terms of geometry, we need more southern stations. And I also talked about more north-south baselines. Um, Again, looking at the map that I showed before, uh, like I said, we need more north-south baselines. We're already seeing the benefit of Korean and Yebes geometries for K-band. We definitely need more southern stations. I have MOPRA on here, but recently we started observations, including uh, MOPRA also in uh, K-band observations. There's a promise of a Thai radio telescope. I talked about the LMT in Mexico, maybe having a K-band receiver on there. There's um, also a radio telescope in South America that we're hoping can be used um, for these purposes. And then there are many of the EVA in uh, European VLBI network stations with K-band, and this will definitely help to improve UV coverage. So we're also looking at including some of those stations uh, for future work. Thanks. Uh, okay. Then in terms of products, um, we want to merge global high frequency astrometric VLBI efforts into one surf, uh, service. In Korea, you are doing things, we are doing things with the celestial reference frame at K-band. There's a group that's been measuring station positions with the EVN uh, uh, using these astrometric sessions. So the idea is to merge all of these efforts into one service and also to make our astrometric and geodetic K-band products available to the community. Currently, it's not freely available to the community. And then also closer cooperation between astrometric, geodetic, and the astronomical VLBI community is another thing that we are looking at. And then in terms of what is the optimal frequency band, um, we know that K-band needs dual band, XK, for example, for our ionosphere calibration. Q-band, the ionosphere is small enough, but the sources are weak. On the other hand, studies show that Q-band can be viable for CRF work. W-band, the ionosphere is not a problem, but we think of, uh, issues with efficiency, pointing issues um, might be a problem. And then, of course, there's this wonderful receiver system from Korea that will maybe in future allow us to do simultaneous celestial reference framework at K, Q, and uh, W-band. Okay, and then why we uh, need Korea. So yes, we know that Korea is in a, or we think Korea is in a position to make key contributions to high frequency celestial reference frame work. Um, it, uh, we are already um, doing observations with the KVN and we are certain that it will further diversify, strengthen the K-band celestial reference frame, not just the network geometry, but also improve the astrometric um, accuracy. And I talked about the Korean um, receiving system that is also now being installed at many other sites, Spain, Japan, Finland, China, Italy, Australia, hopefully maybe in future also in South Africa, on, maybe on the VLBA in New Zealand, Thailand. Um, and then there, uh, there was actually a poster on this mask, uh, mask survey during this meeting. 
So it's this multi-frequency AGN survey with the KVN. There's 1,533 sources and um, so many potential new sources that we can add to the K-band celestial reference frame and also uh, a future Q-band celestial reference frame. So the benefits of Korea to join the K-band work for celestial reference frames is that it will tie the KVN stations to the global VLBI, um, VLBI K-band astrometric network and it will ensure that the KVN in Korea becomes a contributor to the next international celestial reference frame. It will allow for more accurate KVN station positions. It would complement and extend ongoing, the ongoing K-band geodesy uh, campaign on the um, East Asian VLBI network. It will also pr provide a list of well-observed and well-studied K-band calibrator sources that will be accessible to the KVN, extending this uh, KVN calibrator catalog even further. And um, KVN will, contr uh, um, will contribute uh, to the database of this high-resolution multi-epoch K-band images for the astronomical community as well. Our K-band Celestial Reference Frame is an active world-class world program and it is growing and it will provide the KVN with a lasting project with a well-defined science case for transitioning to even higher radio frequencies using this KQW tri-band receivers um, in Korea. So yes, the Korean VLBI program is strong and we look forward to the tremendous contributions that uh, Korea can make to the international K-band uh, community. Oops, oops. Thank you. Thank you, Alain. And, uh, thank you, Alain. And, uh, any questions and comments? Yes. <clears throat> Sorry, could you expand a bit more on how the Korean triple band receiver systems could actually improve the uh, celestial reference frame stuff? Is it just, just having additional frequencies or actually the simultaneous uh, observations can directly help there? That will mean that we can build a celestial reference frame at all frequencies simultaneously, which is great for us instead of. Um, doing, you know, observations at K-band and then Q-band and then W-band. We've had some requests for W-band, especially for calibrator sources. We've done some work at Q-band, but if we can do all of this simultaneously, it would be absolutely wonderful. Uh, something more along the lines of the, the phase transfer system? Would that help in this regard? Yes, I'm sure. Um, the Koreans have been doing a lot of work on that. Um, so, yes, that's also, of course, one of the benefits of having these simultaneous observations. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah. So, thank you. Uh, I, I guess I have to ask this now because right at the beginning of you mentioned that you can use essentially that you can use the, the ground-based VLBI, the geodetic VLBI network also for, what was it, orbit determinations of satellites. So uh, basically, you, you're passively, basically, so, so you're following satellites and compared to, to their GPS positions. How does that work? Right? Actually, we schedule um, special observations where we um, observe um, the satellite signal from the satellites and then some quasar observations. So you have satellite observations, quasar observations in one schedule. Oh, okay, so, so if let's say if in the future I would have a satellite that needs a precise position measurement or, or orbit determination, so we could request a dedicated session with the with your network. Or... Yes, absolutely. There's oh. a um, many papers published on that. Um, already people doing work on, you know, these scheduling satellites and quasars together. It's definitely possible. It's working. Yes, you can. <laughs> thanks a lot, Captain. Yes, uh, I think we can. Thanks to the speaker. Thank, Thank you. you.